Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's Brian Horlick. I want to welcome everybody to our weekly AMA, Ask Me Anything, which we do every Wednesday at 12 noon. And it's our way to keep in touch with our clients, uh, many people in the condominium industry who are board members, who are condominium managers, residents, and industry professionals. As you all know, if you're new to our live stream, we started this live stream right at the beginning of the COVID-19 um, lockdown. It was a way for us to keep in touch with everybody. As I've said before, the condominium industry, it's a large industry, but really is a small industry. And there's a lot of interaction amongst the board members, condominium lawyers, auditors, residents, etc., trade professionals, contractors. And with COVID-19, everybody seemed to be isolated and really out on their own. And we thought if we would be able to host a live stream, it would be a way that everybody could get together, keep in touch, learn a few things about condo law, discuss things of uh, general interest to all of the condominium people that are uh, that are attending to the live stream and it would be beneficial for all. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Now, as you know, we do this Ask Me Anything every week. We started when COVID reared its ugly head. It's our goal, hopefully, that we can continue this after COVID-19 is all said and done. But the way things are going, it looks like COVID-19 doesn't want to take an early exit, although thanks to the very hard work of the government of Ontario, uh, Premier Doug Ford and his able um, assistants and government ministers, as well as the people of the province of Ontario and all of you, thanks to all of everybody's help and hard work, we've certainly uh, been able to turn the corner on this terrible pandemic. So thank you to all. In addition to our Ask Me Anything every Wednesday, we do a case law corner. We send out a video, a short two minute video that is done by our lawyers dealing with a important condominium case, a legal case that has been decided. Uh, in addition to the video, you get a very short summary. The intention is to make you a condo genius, whether you're owner, resident, board member, director, or just an interested person. You can learn all about condo law from those videos. We also do a condo spotlight where we try to interview a, uh, a condominium uh, supplier um, that uh, has a unique and interesting product for everybody. So this is what we're doing. Again, welcome. So what's happening in COVID land? Well, I'll tell you this. The Ontario government has once again um, extended the emergency powers. They've extended the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act until July the 29th. The government has been extending this, um, the emergency order, basically on a weekly basis now. As I said many times before, we, we can all agree that COVID-19 um, is like a reluctant visitor. It's a reluctant guest. It's a guest that doesn't want to leave but will eventually have to leave. So what is the point of extending the emergency orders on a weekly basis? Um, you need the emergency orders to keep all of the um, various restrictions in place. But you don't have to, ex if you stop extending it, of course, there will be no emergency orders. But since COVID is not going anywhere at the moment, I've always been of the view that you should extend it for longer than a weekly basis. So what's happening now is that the government is trying to pass a new piece of legislation. It's called Bill 195. The name of that piece of legislation is Reopening Ontario, a Flexible Response to COVID-19 Act 2020. 
And because the government has the majority power, they will be able to pass that piece of legislation. That piece of legislation will allow the government to continue certain of the emergency orders or amend them. It will not allow them to make new emergency orders, just to continue or amend existing ones. And the government feels that that piece of legislation, once passed, um, will only be necessary for the next year or two. Ahem. So what does that mean? It means that the government will not have to be extending the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act on a weekly basis. They'll have a new piece of legislation that's going to last, let's say, for a year or two, and they don't have to go through this uh, you know, weekly or every two week um, extension of the emergency orders. So it looks like emergency orders will now be replaced by this piece of legislation. That piece of legislation should be um, effective for the next year or two. And what that means is our good friend COVID-19, as I say, the, unlike, the uh, unwelcome visitor and the reluctant visitor, uh, it may be harder to um, move on from than we hope. Um, so that's the latest and the greatest from the government. As we all know, um, the City of Toronto has uh, passed a bylaw making uh, face coverings or masks mandatory in enclosed public spaces. So, for example, uh, stores, uh, commercial uh, businesses, malls, uh, hotels, uh, condos that have short-term rental components, um, all of these things uh, are, are, can be deemed to be, of course, enclosed public spaces. And as enclosed public spaces, um, you need to wear a mask. It's now mandatory, a mask or face covering. And you may ask yourself, what's the purpose of this? Well, uh, the answer might be that uh, the scientists say that uh, COVID-19 is spread by respiratory droplets. Uh, and those uh, droplets emanate from people through coughing, sneezing, laughing, uh, etc. And in, in essence, people are trying to uh, use the mask to stop the spread as best as possible. So, moving forward from the government position, uh, many of the health units, which are the areas or the manner in which the areas of Ontario are divided up, they're divided up by health units. Uh, almost all the health units have now or will be entering stage three, uh, effective on Friday. The stage three has a lot of uh, positive things for the reopening of Ontario. Um, unfortunately and disappointedly, um, Peel uh, and uh, Windsor area and uh, Toronto will still remain in stage two. They are not yet ready for stage three. Uh, yes, although it's disappointing, I think it's for the betterment of uh, everybody that uh, Toronto and Peel don't open too soon. So what does it mean, uh, Stage 3? Stage 3, the following things um, are open, basically. Uh, almost all businesses are now going to be open. Um, you're going to have um, lesser restrictions. You're going to be able to have... Uh, uh, eating in restaurants, as you know, in stage two, which is where Toronto is, you can only eat outside in the patio area, but with stage three, you'll be able to eat inside the restaurant. You'll be able to um, go and um, have a beer if you want in a bar. Nightclubs will still uh, not be open. Um, gyms will be open. Um, however, uh, with respect to all of these businesses, they will all have to still uh, participate in social distancing. They will all still have to have tables far apart, at least two meters, and they will all have to have sanitization stations and plans in place. So, what will not, what you will not have opened in stage three, uh, as it relates to, um, you know, condominiums, is saunas, steam rooms, um, bathhouses, oxygen bars, and um, uh, table games where you sit at the same table. So again, uh, very important, even though uh, most of the province will be in stage three effective Friday, and I presume stage three will come for everybody else in the next few weeks, I, I hope. The thing is, um, it's not an open season. Uh, COVID all of a sudden didn't leave. 
COVID-19 is still there, uh, waiting to uh, secure a new home with anybody um, who lets their guard down. So we need to be very careful, continuing to wash hands, etc. Uh, social distancing, very important. Again, uh, in Toronto, um, where you are in stage two, you are uh, limited to social gatherings of 10 people. Where the stage three has, has uh, come into play, or will come into play as of fr uh, Friday, the uh, indoor gathering rule will go from 10 people to 50 people. The outdoor gathering rule will go from 10 people to 100 people. But again, always physical distancing. And um, uh, if you're in an inside venue, it's no more than 30% capacity has to be used. So let's go to some questions here. All right, Harlan Stavis. Does the CAO have a bylaw or is it in, or, or is it the condo corpse bylaw that does not allow two members of the same household to be on the board of directors? Good question, Harland. We're, just so everybody knows, this is not specifically and exclusively a COVID-19 show. This is a condo show where you can ask questions about anything. So the, the question is really relates to qualifications of board members for the question being um, relating to two members of the same household being on the board. Well, obviously, uh, it's not a, 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 a uh, best practice to have two members of the same household, whether it's husband and wife or whether it's um, co-owners or, uh, you know, tenants. It's not a good idea for um, that, uh, those type of relationships to be on the board at the same time. The reason being is for a a well-functioning board of directors, you want three, five, seven, whatever it is, you want independent um, individuals sitting on that board. And, um, you know, a, a um, family relationship of husband and wife or, um, you know, t groups of people living together um, don't really give you the checks and balances that you need for the board. So where is this set out? Uh, this is not a, a CAO rule or a um, you know, or, or any other type of rule. This is in the qualification section of your operating bylaw. So every condo corporation has an operating bylaw. Um, it's usually bylaw number one, unless it's been amended. You need to look there. There's a specific section on qualifications for board members. You'll find it there. So th there's your answer. Harlan, not a good idea for you and your wife to be on the board at the same time. Sylvia G., Good afternoon. I manage a townhouse, a townhome condo that currently has two board members. The president is pressing to install an awning over her balcony while the other director is in disagreement. Please advise. Uh, well, Sylvia, I, I must say you, you, I'm sure you have your hands full managing that townhouse condo. I'm wondering what happened to the other board members. You're saying here that uh, they currently have two board members. Um, now, if somebody wanted to put an awning over their balcony, that would be acceptable. But uh, normally speaking, the awning would somehow have to be affixed to the outside of the, uh, the brick. And that would normally require what's called a Section 98 agreement. And that is an agreement that the owner enters into with the condominium corporation when there's an addition, an alteration, or an improvement, and it sets out things such as the cost, the color, the size, ownership, maintenance and repairs, etc. In your situation, um, unless the board resolves to do uh, or to have that um, awning put it, put in place, uh, unless there's a board resolution to that effect, it cannot be done. Uh, an owner cannot uh, unilaterally uh, make a change to a, a common element. In this case. Uh, uh, the the uh, bricks on the outside of the building. So they would not be in agreement. The answer to how can they become, how, how can they have an agreement is to appoint a third board member. I presume you have a board of three and there's a, a space for one person, okay? But of course the politicking will start because uh, one of the main uh, qualifications in your building uh, or in your townhouse complex to get on the board at this point in time will be who's in favor of the awning and who's not. 
Next, Ron Britt, how are you? Famous condo manager, does a great job at the promenade. Julia Lurier, hi Brian, hello Julia. We are waiting breathlessly for you to come back from maternity leave at our office and we say hello to your two beautiful daughters. I am sure they're watching because they wanna be a great condo lawyer just like their mom. So we're waiting for you to come back in November, Julia. Mariam Jalali, another great condo manager. How are you? Welcome, nice of you to join us. Ulana, how are you? Question, we are two towers sharing a second floor outdoor terrace, three building exits and multiple resident balconies on this level. Do provincial non-smoking rules apply? Well, provincial non-smoking rules, that's the smoke-free Ontario Act, applies to the indoor common elements. The smoke-free Ontario Act does not apply to the outside common elements. So if you want to deal with outside common elements, what you need to do is you need to pass a rule or you could have an amendment to your declaration. So this situation here, Ulana, you are dealing with outdoor spaces, uh, regardless, regardless of whether there's uh, balconies on the level. The question is, is it an indoor space or an outdoor space? In this case, it's an outdoor space. The Smoke-Free Ontario Act would not apply for the outside. So you need rules there. Next, Miriam Jalali. I have board members who get residents or owner information from security and they take it among themselves to call owners or go and knock on the door if the if the residents are not enforcing the rules what are the consequences for the corporation if someone complains so if i understand correctly here the board members they get they have the access to the information and they go and knock on residents door to enforce the rules uh, i will only tell you that this type of behavior slash conduct is not appropriate. Um, you, you, need to, um, you need to deal or you need to have your condominium manager attend to rule enforcement. It's not for the board members to knock on people's doors. It, some, some people, some residents might even say that that was an invasion of their privacy. When board members are not sitting in the boardroom. They are individual residents or individual unit owners like everybody else. And it's not for an individual board member to knock on someone's door to follow up on a rule violation. Again, we have to keep in mind that the function of the board is to um, uh, manage overall the assets uh, and, and the assets of the corporation and to um, to give direction to management to enforce their uh, their visions their and their um, their resolutions but it's not for the actual board members to physically go out and and do these things when you have uh, professional condominium management uh, you need to provide them with direction and let the manager do his or her job very important Catherine Barbellini, another great manager. How are you, Catherine? If the corporation has a mandatory mask bylaw, would residents and visitors be required to wear them in the underground parking garage? So this is a very good question. What we have right now is a lot of questions surrounding face coverings and masks. The question being, should they be mandatory in condominiums or not? Are they necessary? Is this a good idea? Well, one of the things to keep in mind is social distancing. Again, COVID-19 has not left us. It's just sort of hiding, waiting to grab us. You should be wearing a face covering or a mask in any situation where you cannot maintain social distancing. And social distancing is six feet or two meters. Many condo corporations, the hallways are rather narrow and people are always going to be walking by each other whether it's in the hallways the common element hallways in the elevators there's going to be a lot of interaction now a lot of the 
municipalities have passed mandatory face covering or mask bylaws. These, uh, these right now apply, uh, are mandatory for indoor uh, public spaces. A condo corporation is not per se a public space unless of course it's connected to a commercial component and of course the argument can be made that if you have a tremendous amount of short-term rentals in your building you know, one should be able to look at that as consistent with a hotel lobby in which case man masks are mandatory because it's an indoor public space but as far as a residential condo First of all, it wouldn't be done by way of a bylaw. It would be done either by a rule or a policy. And I would suggest a policy, which is a, a much easier and quicker thing to put forward. I think it would make a lot of sense, depending upon your building, depending upon your community, to have a mandatory uh, face mask or face covering policy. And in that policy, you would set out the areas that you thought would be appropriate for uh, uh, face coverings uh, to be used. So definitely um, the elevators, definitely the lobbies, uh, probably the common uh, element areas, the recreational facilities, because you know, as we all know, with stage three, the recreational facilities are open, the gyms are open, again, with social distancing of six feet, uh, with um, you're gonna, in, in, in stage three, you're gonna be able to have fitness classes, but again, you need to set out a proper, a proper policy, a health policy. You, you should properly be putting uh, markings on the floor six, uh, two, uh, uh, two meters apart so people know where to stand. Um, you're going to have to increase the sanitization of the machines. You're going to have to um, you know, watch how many people are going into your health care, into your recreational facilities, into your gyms, because again, um, you're not allowed to have more than 50 people. Um, moving forward for, for social groups. And again, you need to be very careful about the social distancing. So uh, mandatory masks, yes, I think it's very good. Um, garage area, well, I think it would probably make sense too because there's people coming going in the garage. So, you know, you need to, you know, think it through. But I think anywhere where you're going to have, you know, people going back and forth in the common element areas, I think it only makes sense to have a mandatory mask or face covering policy. Why is it good enough for the TTC to put that in place? Why is it good enough for um, commercial malls and stores to put that in place because you know members of the public are there? But if you have a condominium building of 200, 400, 700, 1,000, 2,000 units, you need to tell me what the difference is um, in in saying that the 700 unit condo uh, shouldn't have a people wearing face coverings uh, or face masks, but the Eaton Center should. I don't see the difference because, you know, there's lots of people and maybe more people in a close proximity in a high rise condo. So I hope I helped you out there, Catherine. Next. Bruna H, another manager, well known, well known. Can the board make masks mandatory for staff, but not for residents? So this is an, an excellent question. Um, again, um, the board can, can pass policies and the boards can pass rules. You need to be concerned not only for your residents, but for your employees, for the people that are working in your building. The um, condominium corporations can pass the mandatory mask policy. They can have it only for um, the uh, employees, but they, they might properly consider doing it for the residents as well, because I think the same type of considerations apply, whether you're a resident or if you're a staff, but probably more so because the staff is dealing with the residents on a constant basis. So good idea for both. Catherine B. Sorry for the repeat. Not sure what happened. LOL. Okay. Property manager who, who wishes to remain anonymous. Well, thank you for joining us, property manager. As much of Ontario as it is entering stage three in gyms and fitness, is physical distancing still six feet? 
as I am hearing that 12 feet would be appropriate in these settings. So you're talking about gyms and fitness distancing and you're saying that you're hearing that 12 feet would be appropriate in these settings. I'm hearing that a million feet might be appropriate in these settings. But seriously, you, the, the rule is for gyms, they're going to be allowed, whether they're commercial gyms or gyms in the condo. You're going to have to have social distancing, so it's two feet minimum, and you're going to have to have a maximum um, amount of people in there, social gathering, maximum of 50. Uh, very important that you're going to have to have the cleaning there, and it's going to be, um, uh, you know, again, you can't use more than 30% of um, the space because that's part and parcel of um, a social gathering. So you'll have to keep the, the, um, the amount of people within reason. You'll have to count the amount of people in re within reason. You will have to know how many people are in the facility and you'll have to uh, put a, a, a specific policy in place as far as, you know, and markings on the floor and, and, and distance between machines. Uh, this is a whole new, it's a whole new thing going on now. And you'll have to be wiping, having those machines wiped down between uses. So there's a lot of work involved and you, I counsel everyone who's got a recreational slash a facility slash gym. If you're not, if stage three happens and you're not ready to move forward with stage three, don't open up your facilities yet. You have to make sure that your plan is in place for stage three before you open. So now is a good time if you're in the city of Toronto, if, if you're in Peel, you should be as a manager, as a board, you should be thinking very, very seriously and making, drawing up your plans because one day um, Doug Ford is going to get on TV as he does on Monday and he's going to say, okay, folks, good news. You in Toronto, you in Peel, you're now in stage three. Bottom line is you have to be ready and you have to have your signs ordered and your policy in place because you're going to have a lineup at your recreational facilities you know, as soon as we're into stage three. Next question. Ron Britt, if face masks are mandatory, are made mandatory in a condo, who is supposed to monitor and enforce this? What is the penalty for not wearing a mask? Well, Ron, for those of you that know you, I'm going to suggest that you will enforce it because you're at least six feet tall and you're a big guy. So it's a good question. The issue is one of enforcement. So before you get to enforcement, you need education and you need to educate owners on the importance of wearing the face covering and why they should. I'm going to assume a number of people will do that and maybe are doing it right now. And I'm also going to assume that some people would rather <clears throat> do anything be, uh, before they are forced or, or they agree to put on a mask. So, you know, there's the people in the condos, like every community that, you know, see the, the, uh, the, the, the reasoning why they should, and there's others that will never, ever, ever comply. So you want to enforce it, to, uh, to absolutely be able to enforce it you know, I would suggest, first of all, if people are not going to comply, you know, you can send out a letter, you can have the lawyer send out a letter, but ultimately, if you want a, a, um, a policy with teeth that you can enforce under the Condominium Act, for sure, if you go by way of a rule, you can enforce that for sure. Uh, the policy you may be able to enforce under, under another provision of your declaration or under Section 117, uh, of the Condominium Act, which deals with dangerous activities. So there are steps that you can take. At the present time, um, as we all know, the face coverings and the masks are only for public, um, enclosed public spaces, and they're only being done so far in Ontario on a municipality by municipality basis. I think only the province of Quebec has now mandated face masks slash coverings for enclosed public spaces throughout the province. All right, next question. Shelly Robinson, our condo AGM is due before the end of September and pre-notice should be sent out by mid-August. Do we still have options to defer and or do you have any info on its status? Well, yes, you have options to 
um, to postpone the AGM. The AGM um, is now required to be held within six months of the end of the emergency order. The emergency order is still in place at the moment until I believe it's July the 29th. And then you have six months from that. But I'm also quite certain that once the government passes uh, their new piece of legislation, which they will be passing very shortly, to this is the legislation that is more it is going to formalize the emergency order so they don't have to be um, extended every week or every two weeks. This piece of legislation will extend things for, uh, for a year or two. I'm sure that issue is going to be covered. But for you right now, you got at least, you've got six months or more uh, from the end of the emergency order. Next, property manager, how to pass a mask policy. Will, will it be enough for board approving on the board meeting and will it be minuted? Well, yes, I believe that the mask policy, policy is something that the board should should pass a resolution to do and they should then um, instruct their condominium corporate corporation lawyer to draft up an appropriate mask policy i can tell you that um, covid 19 has brought a, a certain type of covid activity to condominium law firms I, i'm sure it has in our office and i'm sure it has in everybody else's office but Right now, the issue of face coverings and masks is very, very um, prevalent. We're getting questions about that all the time, and we are drafting for a number of condominium corporations face covering slash mask policies. I can tell you we've also done uh, many um, waivers, COVID-19 waivers, and uh, more general waivers for the use of recreational facilities, uh, pools, community gardens, uh, that type of thing, valet services which many corporations have had in the past, but a lot have not. So it's a good idea for corporations that have various facilities to enter into waiver agreements uh, with the residents so that in the event or the unlikely event that there is ever a lawsuit, the corporation doesn't get sued, but the wrongdoer uh, being the, let's say, the contractor who uh, manages that uh, issue is the one who is responsible. Next question. Julia G, a great manager from York Region. So Julia, I guess you're going to be taking out the board probably Friday for dinner since everybody's allowed to go out as you will be in York stage three. So good for you. And I'll be waiting for my invitation as well. I'm a cheap date. Don't worry. Hi, Brian. Our board wants to know how to make sure that gym and showers for water amenities are adequately sanitized and disinfected. Well, what I would do, basically, I guess number one, there is a tremendous amount of excellent information that the province of Ontario is putting out. And if you look at our FAQs, and I forgot to mention before, but we send out, our office sends out a COVID-19 FAQ, frequently asked questions. We do that every Tuesday. So what happens is um, Doug Ford holds a news conference, usually on Mondays, and sets out the latest information and the latest changes dealing with COVID-19. We have people in our office that study Doug Ford and the government members dealing with this issue we, we study this religiously and we do up a COVID-19 update and it goes out every Tuesday. In that COVID-19 update, there are links. There are links to government websites and government articles. And one of those links will take you to how to reopen um, your building. So I, as part of that, they would deal with the issue of reopening the gym, the showers, etc., and sanitization. And there are many companies that will specialize in this um, or, you know, you can get through your own uh, head office. They can give you some further information. And again, if you want to send us an email, we can flip you the link or we can flip you the article. Next, Phil Usprech. 
a president of a condominium board right up there with the, with the great presidents, including the president of America. So Phil is doing a great job there in the condo, always a busy place, his condo, always a lot of activity, and like every community, always a lot of, a lot of different perspectives on how things can best be done. Phil, can the board take the position that the facilities cannot be opened as it is, as it is felt that the proper steps cannot be done at this time? The answer to your question, Phil, is 100% yes. If a, a condominium board has the responsibility of the over, overall um, management and supervision of the condominium corporation and the facilities, and one of those major responsibilities is to make sure that everybody is safe, everything is secure, and if the board acting reasonably determines that certain common elements cannot now be opened, the, that is their decision. And the courts are, have been very clear that if condo corporations um, make their decisions in a reasonable manner, it is not for the courts to interfere with the governance of the board. Next question. Julia, do we have facilities Users sign a waiver absolving the corporation of liabilities. Well, a number of condominium corporations, in fact, a lot of condominium corporations today have gone that route and they have uh, asked their corporate lawyers to prepare waivers dealing with their, uh, their um, amenities. Uh, some of those waivers are specifically COVID-19 related and others are more encompassing because really and truly you do or you should have a waiver in place for your various amenities. Daniel Brooks, if an owner has a friend who is supposed to be in mandatory quarantine for 14 days after a trip comes to stay with her to quarantine, does this mean the owner should also quarantine? So I think what you're saying is that the owner's friend is, came to stay with the owner in the condo. The owner's friend is quarantined. Um, do both have to quarantine? Well, I'm going to suggest that it should depend upon the size of the unit because quarantine can be you're staying in your room, you're separate and apart from everybody else, and you're using, let us say, your own dishes, etc. You know, that's your quarantine. But if you're all in a bachelor I'm going to suggest it's not a good idea and really the two of them should be quarantining or really shouldn't be in the same unit together. Phil Usbridge, the act and the bylaws are authority that permit the board to adopt rules. Well, um, the adoption of rules are set out, yes, in the bylaws and they're set out in the section 58 of the Condominium Act, absolutely. Boards can and always will um, pr provide and uh, pass reasonable rules for their communities. What is the difference, a policy and a rule? What is the authority that permits a board to adopt policies and avoid the 30 day delay? So the question here is, we all know that boards can pass rules. We all know that there's a 30 day time limit before they're effective. We all know that owners can um, have a vote on rules when they're, when they're passed by the board. Uh, policies, you don't have to have, obviously, um, this 30-day period. Uh, our view has always been that the board has the authority under the Condominium Act um, and uh, under their general powers of um, supervising and managing the affairs of the condominium corporation to pass uh, policies. The policies, of course, like everything else, have to be consistent with the Condominium Act um, and the other governing documents. But, you know, we, we are of the view that the board has this power. Uh, it's inherent in being a board member. Property manager. In regards to fitness rooms, it would be the corporation's responsibility to sanitize between uses. So the question is, for a fitness room, let's say a gym, who has the responsibility to sanitize between the uses? Well, everybody that is 
uh, not a user, would say it, it should be the condo. And everybody who's, who's, who is um, concerned about uh, cost and how many um, hours the condominium manager or the concierge or security has to do their job would be saying, well, the owner should do that or the residents. I'm going to suggest because the issue um, is one of um, such a serious, su such a serious nature that I think it should be incumbent upon every user to properly clean down the machines and sanitize in addition to the condo corporation coming in on at defined times to ensure that this is being done or to reduce the hours of the gym and other recreational facilities to do a real good sanitizing clean uh, er, between, you know, uh, every so often between uses. So I will think, you know, what we, we can always look to guidance for the, um, on the government website, again, they, they will have specific things on how to reopen various amenities. Um, I, I would also look, as I do from time to time, what commercial uh, gyms are doing. But the, end of the, the name of the game at the end of the day is to keep people safe, to keep people um, healthy. The last thing any condominium corporation wants to do is you know, be concerned uh, with the price or the amount of time that the staff are, are, are using to sanitize equipment and all of a sudden there's an outbreak in your building and that is the worst thing that can happen. So I think you know you have to put aside the cost issue. You have to do your very best. Have the the residents that are using the machines um, assist in cleaning when they're done. But go in as a proper responsible um, condo corporation. Have your own staff go in there and do it as well. You know in in this day and age you can't be too careful and you can't be too clean and you got to do everything that you can. All right, while we're waiting for a few more questions to come in, what else is happening in the world of condo? Well, um, if you don't know who Chair Girl is, you're probably uh, well ahead of the game and you don't want to know who Chair Girl is. But Chair Girl is a young lady who um, was living in a high risk condo downtown near the uh, Rogers, um, uh, near the Scotiabank Arena. And she flipped a chair off her 40, off the balcony of her unit, which is 45 floors up. And the chair, I believe, landed on the Gardner Expressway. And uh, she thought she was a real star because she had everybody, she had her friends um, actually video this and she put it on the internet because, you know, she's uh, such a smart young lady. And, you know, this came to the attention of everybody. And Chair Girl was charged uh, criminally. And after uh, much ado, uh, she had her day in court and she was ordered to pay a $2,000 fine. Uh, she was given 150 hours of community service to, uh, to provide and she was given two years probation. Uh, many people think that even though it was a first offense, uh, Chair Girl uh, should, have had, should have received a uh, much stronger sentence because the ramifications of what she did uh, could have been very seriously, somebody could have been seriously injured or died. So Chair Girl, shame on you. I hope you learned your lesson, but Brian Horley doesn't think you did. And I'll be waiting for the next chair, but I'll be watching from across the street. Next, Harold Stavis. Any chance we'll hear more sacks during the breaks? Well, I don't know, Harold. Um, it's a really good question. You know, um, you know, I, I, I played the sax because Jerry DiDonato, he, he cornered me in a commitment and Murray Johnson, everybody's favorite troublemaker, kept bringing it up. So that's why I did it. Now, my wife said to me, if, you, if I do this again, she says she wants to hear me practicing in the basement because she says you're not doing it until you practice in the basement and she wants to be making sure that I am like A1 Mozart. So maybe we'll do it another time. It depends on the people, it depends on all of our fans if they want to hear that or not. And if they do, we'll have to figure out a good tune for them. If you know the tune that we did two weeks ago, um, for those of you that didn't hear, I did play my saxophone. Um, in fact, I played three saxophones at the same time, a tenor sax, 
an alto sax and a soprano sax. And the tune that I chose was what the world needs now is love, sweet love, because after all the things that I see, when I'm looking at the news, that's definitely what the world needs and continues to need. So here we are. Now, before we wrap up, we're just going to touch on a few more condo issues. So as you know, uh, social gatherings now for stage three, for those of you who are not in it, but going to be in it. Um, it's social gatherings are 50 people indoor, 100 people outdoor. With uh, stage three, gyms and playgrounds will now be open. Uh, most physical recreation amenities will be open again stage three, except for steam rooms and saunas, they continue to be closed. As far as amenities are concerned, the gyms will be opened, again social distancing, set up a safety policy, swimming pools opened in stage two. Uh, most things again will be open in stage three, including the playgrounds, outdoor fitness equipment. Um, some uh, corporations are suggesting uh, taking down people's names that are going to be using the facilities for social contacting purposes. Um, other people um, are insisting on enhanced cleaning, uh, restricting hours, making uh, equipment uh, less available, that type of thing. Um, so keeping in mind for us in social in, um, in the city of Toronto, in Peel, we're still in stage two. Social gathering is 10 people. Um, the uh, Real Estate Council is uh, looking to um, loosen up the restrictions on open houses. But as far as I'm concerned, um, we're not there yet, but open houses um, when they are going to be held, will have to be done again, social distancing, uh, limited amount of people coming into the building, and, and you know, always great care and attention uh, being taken. So, um, we've gone through everything. I just want to say, for those of you that um, are enjoying the live stream, there's a button you can click um, to uh, give us the thumbs up, and you can join our, um, our group. Um, we also, as I said before, have videos that we're sending out, uh, short videos every Friday. So some of the videos that we have sent out deal with the following topics. We have one where an owner was complaining of noise in the condo and she felt that the condo was not uh, addressing her, um, her issues at all or quick enough and she brought an application for oppression against the condo corporation and that is a noise dispute. So very importantly, um, if you're an owner, a resident, a board of directors, or even a condo lawyer, because I know a lot of condo lawyers are watching this so they can learn what it means to be a condo lawyer, um, you can, the, the, the judge set out all the tests and all the obligations that you need to do with respect to noise issues. So that's very, very important. We also have done another video um, on water penetration where somebody bought a condo and of course the uh, rains came and the water filled up their attic and filled up their garage lab and their bedrooms and their basement and the condo corporation said hey it's not our business it's your responsibility as an owner the condo corporation wa was brought to court the result was not very favorable to the condo corp so that's another good case for you to read uh, we have other ones as well where um, there was a uh, the right of entry of the condo corporation to go into a unit. The unit owner said, I'm not letting you in. That case didn't fare very well for the owner, and it's a good case as well for anybody who's in the condominium business. Um, last few questions here. Where are we? Uh, okay. All right. Last question is coming from Bruna. Our annual in-suite fire inspection is coming up soon. Any news if we can go inside the suites? Is the fire department going to come after us? Well, it's a very interesting question. Um, you know, we, we have still the COVID-19 issue. Uh, owners, um, many of them owners, many of the residents are reluctant to have people in their suites. And I am of the view that during this period of time, um, we should be respectful. Of, um, of people, of contractors coming into owner's units and uh, we need to deal with that. So perhaps there's some type of a medium 
where the people that are coming in would be wearing proper uh, personal protective equipment uh, and the owner might not be home and security can come in also with proper personal protective equipment. Maybe there's something that could be worked out here. <clears throat> so we are at the end of the road for today. I want to welcome you to next week's live stream. We're going to have Bradley Chaplick hosting. And again, if there's anything you'd like us to do or not do, or if there's anything further you'd like to hear on these live streams, please let us know and we'll be happy to accommodate you. Until we speak again, I wish you all good health and great condo living. It's Brian Horlick from Horlick Levitt Thanks for joining us.